today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Holstrom. We'd like to thank today's episode sponsor, Takeda Oncology, for their support of Myeloma Crowd Radio and Myeloma Patients. Now, this is our 58th show, and we are, um, as, as you know, for April and May, we are in the voting process for the Myeloma Crowd Research Initiative, and the final projects will be named in mid-August. We'd like to encourage you to take advantage of having a little more free time this summer to help us get ready by creating your own fundraising page. You can do that on mcri.mylomacrowd.org and click on Build a Team. Um, Summer is also a great time to host events that are outdoors, like a neighborhood bake sale or keep your kids busy by helping them volunteer their time for babysitting or yard work and donating the proceeds to the MCRI as well. This summer, our family will be hosting an outdoor movie and an end-of-the-year summer salsa party with a silent auction, and we encourage you to do something similar. Now, today we are very privileged to have with us Dr. Alfred Garfall of the University of Pennsylvania. So, welcome, doctor. Thank you very much for having me, Jenny. It's great to be here. Please let me um, introduce you before we get started. Dr. Alfred Garfall is a attending physician at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital and instructor for the UPenn Perlman School of Medicine. He's a reviewer for the Journal of Molecular Diagnostics and has received awards including the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Student Research Fellowship, Distinguished Resident Mentor Award, Brigham and, Brigham and Women's Hospital Finalist, and Finalist for the ASH Research Training Award for Fellows. He's a member of ASH and ASCO and is a pop- popular lecturer speaker on the anti-CD19 CAR T-cell immunotherapy for multiple myeloma. And this week will be a busy week for him, and tomorrow he will be participating in a tweet chat about CAR T-cells, so I encourage you to also listen to that. So, Dr. Garfal, with that, um, you have been participating in this CAR T-cell re- research for quite some time, even before myeloma, so maybe you can, and UPenn has really been on the cutting edge for this type of research. So maybe you can give us a little background about um, how UPenn started with this and how uh, the results that you saw in leukemia and now how you're bringing it to multiple myeloma. Sure. So I should just just, just to make one small correction. I have actually only been involved with this in any uh, serious way with multiple myeloma um, and, okay. and the, much of the work. Um, I mean, th- this field goes back a long ways, um, and, and a lot of this work has been done um, uh, clinically here at Penn and started, I think, in sort of the 2008 2009 range. Um, but of course, this is the, the ability to do clinical trials with this technology is the result of uh, many, many years, probably over 20 years worth of work in, uh, in basic immunology um, and in laboratories uh, led by. Um, uh, at here at Penn, it's been led by Dr. Carl June and a large group of investigators that work with him in the laboratory. Um, and there have been other centers um, who have uh, per, uh, contributed in major ways to the development of, of this technology in the way that we know it today, which is as a, as a technology that can be taken into the clinic to do clinical trials. Um, so I, the, I think there have been there were several very small studies with CAR T cells that predated the one that was published by University of Pennsylvania in 2011 um, in CLL by Dr. David Porter and Dr. Carl June here. That was, but I, I think everybody recognizes that 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 study in 2000, that publication in 2011, was probably the first of the sort of modern era of CAR T cell therapy um, for cancer, um, and that it was the first time that really really long term. Um, remissions were induced and uh, with with safety, um, albeit in just the few patients that were reported in that initial report in 2011. Um, and this work has been uh, basically um, uh, ongoing here at Penn since then, and has expanded in uh, from the initial studies in chronic lymphocytic leukemia to acute lymphoblastic leukemia, um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, and now just over the last year in multiple myeloma. Okay, well, we're thrilled that it's moving to multiple myeloma. So um, maybe you can give us a little bit of background about how you have, what work you've done to start using it in multiple myeloma. But maybe before that, you can just give us a brief overview. We've had some um, interviews on CAR T cells, but I think for those who haven't listened to those, it would be beneficial for you to take a little bit of time to explain what those are and how how CAR T cell therapy works. Sure. So, uh 
CAR T cells are the, the whole concept is basically to try and uh, confer on so T cells are immune system cells in your body um, that have the ability to kill other cells in your body if they're infected with viruses or if they start to um, become cancerous and we know that the immune system and T cells is a, are able to um, naturally you know uh, stamp out small cancers before they become you know, uh, you know, real problems for patients. But unfortunately, in patients who have developed a cancer, by definition, the immune system has failed to control that cancer. Um, so, that, so investigators for a long time, you know, for decades, have been trying to figure out ways to kickstart the immune system um, to uh, allow it to, uh, uh, to, to go after cancers that have been established in patients. So CAR T cells are just... Um, one mechanism or one method to do that. There are actually a number of really promising uh, uh, modalities within the realm of immunotherapy that are really paying clinical dividends. Uh, as we've seen the last few years, I think the, the one that people know the most about right now is uh, anti-PD-1 and PDL one therapies. Um, but certainly CAR T cells are a very one of the very promising modalities for immunotherapy for cancer. Um, CAR, the idea of CAR T cells is that um, you know, every T cell uh, in your body, uh, or almost all T cells, have, a, have an ability to recognize another protein in another cell intrinsically within them, but every T cell is different in this regard. What, CAR T, what you're able to do with CAR T cells is take a bunch of T cells out of the body uh, that may or may not recognize the cancer intrinsically, and by genetic engineering, give them the ability um, to recognize a protein on the surface of cancer cells. And that's what the CAR is, a chimeric antigen receptor. It's a, it's a genetic modification to the T cell that allows the T cell uh, to recognize um, uh, a cancer cell as though that were the, the natural target for that T cell. So that way when all these cells are infused back into the body after they've been grown outside the body and expanded, they can go into the body um, and, and, uh, on reinfusion and recognize uh, the cancer cells and kill them. Um, and so in addition to uh, the CAR T cells, by that genetic modification to the cells that makes them CAR T cells, uh, within that genetic modification, in addition to uh, putting that molecule on the surface of the cell that gives it the ability to recognize the cancer cell, also built into this whole process are mechanisms to um, activate the T cell so that it's active when it goes back into the body and is able to kill other cells and also allow that T cell to divide and expand in the body and also to persist so that at the end of this process, in addition to killing off a bunch of cancer cells, you get some kind of long-term immunity against the cancer. Um, and that seems to be important, at least in some of the experience with, with CLL and ALL, uh, to be important for uh, making this a really durable remission. Okay, that's a great explanation. Thank you so much. And, and can you dig a little more or tell us a little more about the results that were found in leukemia, why you, you thought those, or why the group has thought this is so promising? What was so exciting so the, about that? Sure. So the initial results in, uh, the, the first study done at Penn was in patients with uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And this study was done um, by Dr. David Porter in collaboration uh, with Dr. Carl June's group, um, and the the rationale for starting in chronic lymphocytic leukemia uh, was first that the f every CAR T cell uh, needs a target, um, and in this case they they use CD19 as the target, which is a target that's expressed um, on most B cell malignancies in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, um, along with acute lymphocytic leukemia and other uh, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, other uh, hematologic cancers are B cell. Uh, our B lineage uh, cancers that express CD19. Um, and I actually don't know all the details about how they selected CD19 as the first target, but it was a good target to choose because it was fairly uh, restricted in its expression to, the can to cancer cells and to normal B cells. Uh, and it turns out that if the, the, the concern, of course, uh, with the target selection is toxicity. So if you infuse a bunch of cells that have the ability not only to recognize cancer cells, but normal cells, you can get a lot of toxicity. And it turns out you do get elimination of normal B cells with with anti-CD19 CAR T cells, um, but that's actually fairly well tolerated. Patients can live without their B cells. They're at some increased
increased risk of infection, but that can be dealt with with immunoglobulin infusions. So it was a target that was was very well characterized and expressed on um, a large uh, range of B-cell malignancies and was also one insofar as it was expressed on normal cells that the loss of those cells could be tolerated. Um, so it was a good target to start with and one that they had done a lot of work in the laboratory uh, using mouse models of leukemia to test um, and, and fine-tune uh, the design of the CAR T cells. So I, I believe that's why uh, it was, uh, so those diseases were chosen as the first clinical trials to try this in humans were diseases that were CD19 positive. Uh, and and um, why CLL versus ALL, I'm not actually sure why uh, CLL was chosen as the first disease, but um, in short order after some of the promising results were obtained with CLL, uh, the, the team here went on to design studies um, in acute lymphocytic leukemia um, and in uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And those studies have also been popping up at some of the other um, uh, sites around the country and indeed around the world uh, that are leaders in this technology, like the National Cancer Institute um, and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and Baylor College of Medicine. Um, all of those studies have, uh, all of those groups have basically uh, worked in parallel uh, doing studies in, in these diseases, and most of them have chosen CD19 as the first target. But now, with some experience starting to move into other targets um, for for both other uh, hematologic malignancies, like um, like multiple myeloma, uh, for which CD19 may or may not be a good target, and then of course other solid tumors um, like uh, like pancreas cancer, uh, brain cancer, where we have some studies ongoing at Penn uh, using other targets uh, uh, for those diseases. Okay, perfect. Well, do you want to talk about the target for a minute? Because you mentioned how you can target different proteins. So mm -hmm. the the expertise, it sounds like, was on CD19 and leukemia because it, it had that um, present probably more than or as a single target. But in myeloma, can you describe why you're going after CD19 and if there's a, an advantage to doing just one target, multiple targets? Mm -hmm. um, you know, but... Yes. Yeah. Sure. Mind. So, this. The, so the 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 study that that we've been doing for the last year has been using these anti CD19 CAR T cells, the same CAR T cells that um, Dr. Porter uh, has been using in CLL, and Dr. Fry here has been using um, in ALL, um, and Dr. Gruff has been using in pediatric ALL. Uh, so the same anti CD19 CAR T cells we've been using in multiple myeloma, um, and multiple myeloma was not initially thought about as a target for anti-CD19 CAR T cells because most multiple myeloma is, gen is considered CD19 negative. In other words, the, if you look at a patient with multiple myeloma, um, by standard techniques, you don't really find uh, CD19 on multiple myeloma plasma cells. So it's a little bit of a roundabout story how we ended up deciding to try the anti-CD19 T cells in these patients. Um, so the, it actually, the story starts with uh, several collaborations between my mentor, Dr. Ed Statmauer, who's the um, head of our uh, multiple myeloma program here at Penn. He had actually collaborated with Dr. Carl June um, on a number of studies that predated the clinical use of CAR T cells using other types of cellular immunotherapy, other manipulations of T cells, genetic engineering, vaccine priming, um, to, and did several uh, studies in multiple myeloma patients over the last I think they started in the early 2000s with this and published a few papers over the last 10 years uh, reporting results from those studies. So there was a, a nice collaboration already in place between uh, Dr. June's group, who was developing the CAR T cells, and our myeloma program here. And so when, uh, when, when they started doing work in CLL, there was a natural tendency to try and think of ways to um, incorporate that work into multiple myeloma. Meanwhile, there is this as I mentioned, CD19 is not an obvious target multiple myeloma, but there is this um, sort of messy string of reports that have been published over the last 20 years or so suggesting that either a, sub, a, a small portion of myeloma cells or other CD19 positive cells that kind of live among B cells in myeloma patients might be part of the multiple myeloma and contribute to its ability to grow and develop and resist therapy. So even though you know, in most patients, the lion's share of myeloma cells, the plasma cells you see under the microscope in the bone marrow and the cells that are churning out, you know, the immunoglobulin and causing the bone damage, even though most of those cells may be CD19 negative, there might be a small population 
of sort of, you know, mother cells or queen bee cells, you might call them, that are really important for perpetuating the disease in, uh, in response to, uh, in response to um, uh, therapy and promulgating drug resistance. Um, and, and that's a kind of confusing literature. Um, and some studies have suggested uh, that, that, uh, that getting rid of these cells, getting rid of these CD19 positive B cells or these small subsets of plasma cells that express CD19 might be uh, an effective way to treat multiple myeloma. But it had never really been tested in humans. There are a bunch of mouse studies that looked at this and some studies examining patients' plasma cells in the laboratory, but nobody had ever really subjected this to the test of a clinical trial. So we thought, well, we have, we're really interested in CAR T cells from myeloma. The actual, uh, you know, the, the sort of newer targets for myeloma weren't available at the time um, when we started thinking about this idea. Uh, but we did have available here at Penn these anti-CD19 CAR T cells that were showing to be effective at at least eliminating CD19 positive cells in patients with CLL and ALL. So um, we started thinking about a clinical trial design that would just in a small number of patients with very, very high risk disease um, and not many standard therapy options, just give this idea a try that had shown some, you know, uh, sort of interesting results in the, in, the, in the laboratory over the years that maybe getting rid of these sort of small population of CD19 positive cells might be effective. Uh, so what we did was, um, you know, we, we didn't think that just infusing the CAR T cells against CD19 would work in and of itself because we only thought that maybe a small portion of the myeloma uh, had CD19 on it. Uh, so what we did was couple the infusion of CAR T cells with another therapy that's very effective at getting rid of the bulk of the plasma cells in patients, and that's autologous stem cell transplantation, so high-dose melphalan and autologous stem cell transplantation. Um, and that was a convenient companion therapy to the CD19 CAR T cells because it turns out that before you give someone CAR T cells, you really should give them a little bit of standard chemotherapy first because it helps the CAR T cells when they're infused into the patients um, uh, uh, grow and expand and also last over the long term. So we thought, hey, we have sort of two things that this high-dose melphalan and autologous stem cell transplant can do here. Maybe it can get rid of uh, a, a, a large portion of the plasma cells that might be CD19 negative and also sort of you know, create an environment where when we put in the anti-CD19 CAR T cells, they can grow and expand and persist, uh, and in the process, get rid of some of these small, uh, the small population of CD19 positive cells that might be part of the multiple myeloma but resistant to traditional chemotherapy, and see if we can, with those two therapies together, get longer responses than we would expect with just doing the transplant alone. So that's a sort of roundabout and complicated answer, but I hope hopefully explained a little bit how we ended up coming up with the trial design that we did combining anti-CD19 CAR T cells with auto transplant for myeloma. Oh, no, that's great. It sounds like you're going to debulk with the melphalan and then follow it up to see if you can wipe everything out. So I think it sounds great. So can you tell us a little bit more about the study? Is the study still open, and how many patients did you want to have in it total? Are you recruiting for it, or...? So we we'd actually just uh, today infused our 10th patient on the study, um, and the study was designed as a 10-patient pilot study um, just to mm -hmm. kind of see what kind of results we, we saw with a small group of patients. So we, we opened the study and um, infused our first patient last July, um, and over the course of the last year, we've now infused 10 patients with myeloma with anti-CD19 CAR T cells. Um, and, uh, and we are... Uh, thinking uh, about expanding the study slightly with some modifications to make some improvements based on our results so far, um, but we have not uh, made final plans for that, and we're still waiting to hear um, about some uh, some feedback to the protocol amendment from our regulatory agencies and also see about funding to treat a few extra patients. So right this minute, we are not um, recruiting patients for the CD19 CAR study, but we are going to be opening next month, and this should pop up on clinicaltrials.gov and the next month or so, um, a CAR T-cell study that will be um, led by Dr. Adam Cohen, another one of the myeloma investigators who focuses on immunotherapy in our group. And that will be a study uh, using CAR T-cells against another target called BCMA, which is the same target that um, uh, the NIH is uh, currently doing a CAR T-cell study with. Um, so we, uh, so while we're not accepting patients for the anti-CD19 CAR study, we should have another CAR study open for myeloma patients in the next month or so. 
Okay, fantastic. So that's for relapse re- refractory patients, right? That you, the ten that you have right now. Yeah. So all these patients uh, on our on the CART nineteen study, the anti CD nineteen CAR study, are patients who have had a previous autologous stem cell transplant and had a short response. So as, as you know, if you if you uh, if a typical patient with myeloma who has an autologous stem cell transplant and then goes on some maintenance therapy, the disease stays under control for a number of years, maybe three or four years is the typical uh, typical duration of response. Um, but of course, there are some patients um, in whom the transplant doesn't lead to that you know nice long period of disease control, and the disease starts growing you know, in a much shorter amount of time. And those patients are patients that we call high-risk patients, meaning that, you know, even though some other therapies might be available that work for them, we know that the disease is, is uh, aggressive and is not likely to respond to very long to subsequent therapy. So what we did was design the study specifically for those patients, so patients who have had a short response to their first autologous stem cell transplant. So um, all of our patients had uh, less than one year of response to a prior transplant, and all of them have progressed through other therapies that they received after that transplant. So they come, came to our study um, with fairly advanced disease, having had multiple prior therapies, having progressed through those therapies, in some cases having progressed through um, experimental therapies as well. And, uh, and, and so when we... Um, uh, treated them on our study, uh, they had quite advanced disease. And what we did was because we wanted, even though we only were able to treat just 10 patients, we wanted to get a sense of whether this was working. And that might be tough to do if we're just combining it with transplant because transplant itself, even in patients with aggressive disease, does have the ability to control the disease for some amount of time. So because these patients all had a prior stem cell transplant, and we know from experience that patients who get second or third stem cell transplants, the -hmm. responses to the second or third stem cell transplants, while they can be effective at controlling the disease for some time, the responses are typically short, and they're shorter than the responses to the last transplant in any particular patient. Um, So what we did was take these patients who had quite advanced disease, uh, give them a second transplant with the CART-19 cells, and then in addition to just making sure that the cells are safe in this setting um, and looking at how they grow in the patients and whether they hit their target, we're also at the same time comparing their responses uh, on the study to the response they had to the prior transplant to get a sense of whether the addition of CAR T cells to the transplant um, is adding anything. And that, and so we presented at, at ASCO in June, the results of just the first five patients that we've treated who we have somewhat longer follow-up and that we could really get a sense, at least in preliminary form, about how they were doing uh, with this transplant with CART-19 compared to the transplant they had previously. So these are all, so that as a, <laughs> it was a long answer to your question about whether these patients are relapsed refractory, and the simple answer is yes, they were relapsed refractory patients, as will, you know, because of the phase one study, the BCMA CAR study that we'll be opening will be also for patients who are, um, who are sort of relapsed and refractory. So in that stage of the treatment where the disease is growing um, and uh, the physicians are just kind of moving between different therapies, trying to keep the disease under control as long as possible, it's those kind of patients that we're going after in these early phase studies. Mm-hmm. Okay, no, that's a great explanation. I think we like the more detail, understanding who who you have tried this on. So I think it's perfect. So what mm-hmm. did you learn? I mean, you, you presented at ASCO, but maybe you could give us a very short explanation of your presentation. Sure. So... Well, as I said, what we presented at ASCO were were the early results from our first five patients. And again, the first patient we've observed for quite a long time now because she received therapy on the study over a year ago. Um, So the uh, the first thing we learned is that the the cells seem to be safe when given uh, 14 days after high-dose melphalan and autologous stem cell transplantation. Uh, There's always concern about safety with CAR T cells. There's the potential for the cells to hit targets that we don't anticipate that they'll hit. And there's also the potential for even if they're just going after the targets we think they're going to go after, that the cells begin to expand very rapidly in patients and cause this thing called cytokine release syndrome, um, which has the potential to make people quite ill and, you know, low blood pressure, difficulty breathing, requiring care in the ICU. And so we were nervous, you know, just because, just because the, uh, um, 
uh, just because this, this, these cells have behaved a little bit differently in the different mm-hmm. disease in which they've been tried. The cells have behaved the same cells, same exact cells have behaved differently in patients with CLL versus patients with ALL. We were wondering if we were going to see some unexpected things when we tried them in myeloma patients. And fortunately, with the dosage that we chose and the schedule that we chose, at least for this early phase study, we didn't see any um, uh, unexpected or severe toxicity. Um, in terms of how the patients did, um, as I said, we're comparing their response to the first transplant uh, to, their, uh, to their previous transplant, to the response they had on our study where they got a transplant plus the CART-19 cells. And, um, uh, the, the, and what I walked, when I went, th- what I went, excuse me, what I went through in the ASCO presentation um, was the data for just the first couple patients. So the first patient who's been um, a really dramatic success and a, a fortunate success for us to have such a, a patient do so well as the first patient on our study, and of course the fortunate success for this patient. Um, she had a, a high-risk disease with deletion of 17P, the, T, the P53 deletion, and a complex cytogenetics, and she actually had a prior transplant back in 2010, and the disease began growing again just three months after that first transplant, and she met the official criteria for progression um, six months after her first transplant. And that's despite the fact mm-hmm. that as soon as her disease started growing, she began receiving uh, you know, th- therapy with lenalidomide and other agents. Um, and she only had a, um, a partial response to her first transplant. Um, and so on our study, she fortunately went into a complete remission, um, and that remission has been sustained now. As when I presented it at ASCO, it was just nine months, but now we just saw her a few weeks ago, and I can tell you that she's still in a nice remission, a complete remission, at least by the criteria of negative serum protein electrophoresis, negative urine protein electrophoresis, um, uh, a year after therapy. So this was disease that we wouldn't expect to be under control this long just with a transplant because her last transplant didn't work very well. Um, But uh, with this therapy has been in remission, uh, in a a very deep remission for over a year, and she really has no evidence of um, disease complications. She has a normal CBC. She's living her life. Um, Now, of our other five, of the other four patients who have been treated, we don't have a story quite like hers yet. Um, We have another patient who has, um, has, uh, has had a response that's lasted longer than her prior response. Uh, She still has some measurable disease, so not a complete remission, but it's not behaving nearly as aggressively as it was before, and it's sort of just flat and stable uh, and not really growing in any substantial way. So that is another patient we feel like the therapy may have been effective in, um, and we'll have to see over time. We haven't followed her quite as long as we have the first patient. Um, Another patient had a a five-month remission. Uh, She had plasma cell leukemia, so a very high-risk disease, a five-month remission. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Previously, after her first transplant, she had a six-month remission, so not as dramatic a a story, but perhaps uh, some benefit from the T-cells. And then we've had two patients whose disease has progressed pretty quickly after the transplant on study. Um, So one patient whose disease progressed um, within uh, just uh, 42 days of the transplant on study and another patient whose disease progressed about 60 days after the transplant on study. So um, all told, we have two of the first five patients who, are, um, who, have, who have not had their disease progress, including one patient who's had a very long, sustained, complete remission. Um, and then three, one other patient who we think may have benefited, and actually we're about to retreat her because she had a, a nice remission, and we found actually uh, she had some CD19 expression on her myeloma cells, which is not the typical pattern that we see. Um, and so we think she may benefit from another infusion of the cells, so we're going to give that a try next month. And then um, the two other patients who progressed very quickly after the study um, who we don't think benefited, so we didn't consider reinfusion in those patients. Okay, in in my mind, I mean, my mama, we're all so unique, right? And we have such different features. And in talking to some of the other doctors, they've said, you know, the average myeloma patient has five different kinds of myeloma at at diagnosis. So are you looking at um, some of the genetics? Because when you go to, to do a clinical trial design and you say, okay, well, it worked fabulously, for three patients and it worked okay for three patients and for two patients it didn't work well. And so, you know, sometimes you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, okay, you know, therapy A might might be not a good therapy, but therapy B, it worked in a few more patients. But it might work for that, you know, patient A 
100%. So you want to find all the patients like that and then maybe do a clinical trial with just those patients. No, you're exactly right. And and that's why, you know, in a in a in a pilot clinical trial like this, we're really just looking for um, the first sense of whether and for whom a, a, a new therapy might work. Um, and we're looking very carefully at all the things that you mentioned. So we're looking at their genetic subtype. We're looking at things as simple as whether they have IgA versus IgG myeloma. Um, and mm-hmm. then we're also looking at uh, at a much more sophisticated level at things like, you know, is there actually any CD19 in the patient's plasma cells? Are there tiny subsets of the plasma cells that have CD19 on them? Um, are there any other features that might uh, establish whether or not somebody responded? We're looking about at how long the T cells persist in patients and whether we can find uh, right after the transplant, can we find small bits of minimal residual disease and can we study that minimal residual disease to understand the biology of it that might allow us to understand uh, how the therapy is working. So we're doing uh, a lot of analysis like that and a lot of it's a little bit too preliminary to talk about the results of, um, but mm-hmm. we, we have some ideas about uh, about these issues and we're going to do our best to learn um, from the second five patients that we've treated just over the last couple months as as they um, as they have longer follow up whether we can uh, uh, you know learn anything uh, from their patterns of response and relapse uh, about about how this is working and uh, not only you know uh, for whom it might work in its current form, but what modifications can we make it uh, can we make to the therapy and the way we're delivering it uh, to make it work as well as it did for our first patient for more patients and I would imagine that with five patients it's hard to see those patterns, but I know that you have the tools to be able to do that. But well, that's exactly it's, right. It, 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 a small number of patients is hard, but you just look for look look for you know we we sort of chase on anything we find, um, and then you know try and we'll try and follow things over the next five patients, and um, and perhaps we'll have the ability to make some modifications to the protocol and test some of our hypotheses about how we can improve this with another group of five patients, and um, and then in the meanwhile, uh, as I mentioned, we'll have the the BCMA CAR study where we hopefully will learn about the potential efficacy of another target, uh, and depending on the results there, who knows, we may be in a situation uh, down the road where we could potentially combine targets, or if one looks much better than the other, go with one target. But I think there's, um, you alluded earlier to the potential for combination strategies, and, you know, basically anything that you, all all those things that you suggested are all uh, ideas that we've had and that we will um, consider in in the context of our big team here um, uh, about ideas uh, going forward. Yeah, I think that's the challenge for you because when you look at something like this and you say, okay, there's BCMA as a target, there's CD19 as a target, maybe there's CS1 as a target. And as a patient, I would say, gosh, give me them all, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and because because I know I know you're trying to test them one at a time, but if myeloma is so um, wily and sometimes it hides and sometimes, you know, something might knock three types of myeloma down, like your transplant might do that, but the the other kinds that may be potentially more aggressive then grow up after that part's knocked down. Um, I just, it it's interesting to see how clinical trial design is created because maybe together they would be hyper effective and maybe alone they might be moderately effective. I don't know. Uh, yeah, and I and I completely agree. And you know, and as and it's and it's interesting because while you know, CAR T cells are 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 a very hot new topic, an amazing opportunity for cancer therapy. Um, and there are very unique issues that go with CAR T cell clinical trial design, but actually the same old rules also apply about how you test these things. Um, and, you know, just as we've seen, you know, you know, if you think back to the, you know, mid-2000s when the studies were being done with Revlimid and Velcade, and then eventually people figured out that if you combine them, um, you know, you get, you know, synergistic activity. And we saw just recently with the publication of the study that combined elotuzumab, which is the anti-CS1 antibody, with mm-hmm. um, with Revlimid, you know, uh, elotuzumab showed, you know, in the laboratory you could see that there were some promising signs in terms of its ability to generate anti-myeloma immune responses. In the clinic, as a single agent, it wasn't as impressive, but then when it was combined with Revlimid, suddenly you get real activity. Um, and I and I think we're going to go through the same process with CAR T cells. Unfortunately, and, and we're as impatient with this as the patients are, um, but, you know, the first 
the first test that any new therapy has to overcome is whether it's safe. And it's very difficult to evaluate safety when you're combining it with other therapies that have other side effects. So I think we will see at first the the T cells against these targets will be tested in patients as single agents. Um, but then I think everybody is very excited about many, many different combinations. So combinations of different you know, CAR T-cells against different targets, combinations of T-cells with some of the other drugs that are established for multiple myeloma, such as uh, drugs that like lenalidomide and pomalidomide that have the ability to stimulate the immune system, and also some of the other exciting um, immunotherapies that have uh, that shown a lot of have shown a lot of success in other malignancies like lung cancer and lymphoma, namely the PD-1 inhibitors, and I think we will see, you know, very soon um, combination studies start to pop up with CAR T cells. Probably first in the in the in the uh, diseases in which they're a little bit more established, like ALL and CLL, but hopefully, you know, before long in myeloma also. And uh, a couple questions about that. So when you say soon, I I do believe that's true, and I know a lot of people are working on it. How soon do you think that could happen, where one one CAR T cell therapy gets approved, you know, quote approved, and um, then can be used in combination with others? So I I don't think I could. I just don't know exactly the timelines for these things, but it just seems like things are moving quite quickly, um, and yeah, the. And and now that we have FDA approved agents that are you know targeting PD1 and PDL1 that you know these are you know very safe agents to give, um, I think we will start seeing studies popping up, you know, in the next year or so combining CAR T cells with. And this is not based on any insight knowledge that I have about particular plans at Penn, but just seeing you know where the where the field is going and the availability and the activity of these agents um, uh, and and the you know interest basically across all the centers that are working on on CAR T cells and immunotherapy to combine them, uh, I, I think we'll start to see studies popping up in the next year or so. Mm, perfect. Well, let's talk about safety for a minute because I know you mentioned um, that sometimes there can be safety issues. So how do you mitigate that? And, and I know you said you've learned that post-14 days after transplant is a really appropriate time to give them, but are there other things? that you watch for or are um, cautious about or you're doing for safety? Yeah, so we, we've, you know, we've learned a lot from the experience in, in, the, uh, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, acute lymphocytic leukemia, um, and, and, and with the, uh, the children's, the, the, the pediatric studies as well. Uh, and we've learned a lot from studies going on at multiple centers. You know, the, we've learned a lot from our own studies here at Penn, but of course we've learned a lot from the studies going on at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And we've even learned uh, some from studies going on with other immunotherapies, um, such as the experience with ipilimumab, where you see some autoimmune toxicity. Where that's an that's a immunotherapy that's been approved for a few years now in melanoma. Um, and also the, the studies of a, a drug called called blunatumumab, which is an anti-CD19 therapy, uh, so-called, uh, it's called a bite, which is not quite an antibody, but not quite a CAR T-cell um, uh, for, for ALL. And so we're learning how to manage some of these autoimmune toxicities, and um, like the cytokine release syndrome, fortunately, uh, and, and uh Thanks to some very clever work that was done early on in, in the other studies here at Penn that I mentioned previously, we learned um, that there is an uh, uh, antidote to cytokine release syndrome that can be used uh, called tocilizumab, which is an antibody that targets interleukin-6, which is one of the inflammatory chemicals that the immune system releases as the CAR T cells expand in the body, um, and that when patients get into trouble with severe cytokine release syndrome, in almost all cases, the tocilizumab is able to completely reverse that. Um, and, and those patients actually can still have a nice response to the CAR T cell therapy, even after getting that response or, or that inflammatory reaction shut down with the antibody. Um, so that's, that, that's one major toxicity um, that, that is not completely dealt with by that antidote, but, is, but that antidote has been very helpful in making this a, a safe uh, therapy for development. Um, and then the, uh, you know, for CD19, I think we're fairly comfortable with the safety of that as a target um, in, in these patients. Um, but I think in terms of the new um, 
the newer targets that are coming out, that's a very important thing to make sure that the CAR T cells don't go after some other organ in the body uh, that has a protein that looks like the target or the target isn't expressed in some other cell in the body other than the cancer cell. And that's why these studies, um, you know, start as phase one studies where we use a lower dose of the cells um, and watch patients very, very carefully and only treat one or two at a time. Um, and then uh, as we get sort of comfortable with the toxicity. Now, fortunately for um, for uh, for a lot of these targets, monoclonal antibodies have been developed against some of the targets uh, before the CAR T cells are developed. So, for example, mm-hmm. for, for BCMA, there's actually a trial going on um, sponsored by GlaxoSmithKline um, using uh, uh, a BCMA antibody. Um, and while we don't have access to all the data from that study right now, um, that at least... You know that the studies of antibodies can give us some information about the safety of a target um, because CAR T cells and antibodies are often developed against the same targets, um, and so you can extrapolate a little bit some of the toxicity data from the antibodies to the CAR T cell. But that's you have to be careful about that as well because we think CAR T cells are much more sensitive and active than antibodies. So uh, an antibody that's safe might not necessarily translate into a CAR T cell that's safe. Oh, that makes sense. And and you mentioned one for CD19, and then there's a companion, you know, that you, you've been working with. And then wouldn't ilituzumab be the same one for a CS1 CAR T cell target? Exactly, absolutely. So CS1 is, is one of the most promising CAR T cell potential targets. Um, I believe the inst- I believe the center that's closest to opening a clinical trial of an anti CS1 car is Ohio State University, um, and I don't know exactly the timeline for that. Um, but 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 certainly the safety of elotuzumab, uh, which is an antibody targeted against CS1, um, uh, is promising with respect to the safety of um, of a CS1 based car T cell. And do you think you could ever use them together? The antibodies and the CAR T cells? Mm-hmm. Like for the same target, for let's say CD19 or CS1 or something, you'd use a CAR T cell and a monoclonal antibody? I, so I don't see why that couldn't be tried. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn about the, about, um, you know, for I think that's probably going to be something that, you know, uh, it might be different for each specific target. And we'd have to learn a little bit more about how they work alone Um uh, before we thought about combining them, but I, I think uh, I, I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't give that a try. And um, how do you test for the presence of these T cells to know, like, let's say you had an option between, you know, maybe three different clinical trials, and how would I test to say, do I have more CD19 present, or do I have more BCMA present, or which one would be better for me personally? Yeah, so that's a very, very good question, and um, it's a question we actually haven't faced uh, in practice yet because we um, we have uh, you know we we haven't had this menu of CAR T cells to right. choose from. Um, but it is it is an important thing to consider. So uh, some of the you know ideally in an ideal world, the target for the CAR T cell is something that is so. Uh, intrinsic to the nature of the disease that is present on everybody, um, and that mm-hmm. seems to, that's almost the case with CD19 for a lot of the other diseases in which it's been tried. For example, you know non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, you know the fused large B cell lymphoma, CLL, and basically it all has CD19. Um, BCMA is pretty close to that for for multiple myeloma. I think almost all myeloma expresses BCMA, at least in the studies that have looked at that so far. Um, now we're we're going to be looking carefully, and as I'm sure other centers are as well, about, you know, is all BCMA expression the same? Is all CD19 expression the same? For example, in a myeloma that's 90%, you know, positive for one uh, for one antigen, um, is there a small subpopulation that's not positive? And that requires some sophisticated laboratory analysis. Um, so I, I hope we will get good over time at predicting which target is best for which patient, um, or better yet, which combination of targets is best for which patient. But I think it's going to take um, more study um, uh, before, we can, before we can do that. Hmm. Okay, great. And, and I know sometimes we've heard a little bit about um, the protein loss. Like sometimes when you give the CAR T cells, sometimes the cells will just 
um, lose that target on the top, even though there's still myeloma cells. So the um, the CAR T cell therapy, you know, doesn't recognize it. Essentially, do you see that? Have you seen that in the CD19 studies that have been done? And how often does that happen? Or um... yeah, it's, so it's a it's a it's it's fascinating, and it and it really humbles you, right? That that the that mm-hmm. the that the cells are so clever that they can. Uh, you know, do these kind of evasive maneuvers, but of course, it's something. It's, a, it's a, but it, at, at the same time, it's a phenomenon we're very familiar with. You know, from other cancer therapies. So we know that uh, you know almost every other therapy for cancer, and certainly for myeloma, that even when it's really effective at first, resistance develops, and whether it's down regulation of 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 the target of a car or some other molecular. Um, trick that the cancer plays to evade uh, therapy, you know, this is a phenomenon that we deal with with virtually all cancer therapy. So, yes, in the patients, um, in some of the patients who have developed resistance to anti-CD19 CAR T cells, uh, th- there has been um, this escape where the where the tumor cell just kind of turns off CD19. Um, and so ultimately the solution to that might be to have multiple targets for each disease. Um, and that's why it's important, even though we have some success with CD19 in myeloma, that, you know, we in parallel sort of at multi- multiple centers around the country develop, you know, CAR T cells against other targets um, so that we can ultimately, you know, deal with, you know, relapse with just another target, um, or perhaps go in with both targets, you know, at the same time to sort of circumvent that resistance. Um, the ideally, you know, you can deal with some of this by selecting your target wisely too. So the best, you know, the the cell can't turn off something that it requires for its survival, right? Um, mm-hmm. So if you pick a target that's really required for the cell to survive it can't turn it off. Um, and, and that's not always possible, but ideally you, the, the target that you develop a CAR T cell against is one that's really impo- it's not only expressed on all the cells, but it's really important for that cell so that it can't easily turn it off um, and still survive. Very interesting. So now maybe you want to give a quick description of the therapy overall. And my question, I have a second question about it because you said in one of the patients you gave them her additional an additional dose, basically. So as I understand it, it's like a one-time shot, or maybe you want to explain how that works. Sure, sure. So, uh, And this is, I I think, because all the studies, or most of the studies that have been done so far, early phase studies, the, the the studies have basically been give one dose to the cells and see what happens. And, and we hope that, you know, kind of like trans, like allogeneic transplant is, this is a living therapy. So, uh, the goal is that uh, when the cells go into the patients, that they that is that even though there's just one infusion of the cells, the actual therapy lasts for a long time if the cells persist. Um, now we've now one of the big mysteries and conundrums in in this field right now is being able to predict which patients hang on to the T cells and and which patients do the cells survive over the long term because we know that it's very variable. So in some patients Mm. with CLL, the first patients treated here at Penn with CLL, some of them have T cells that have been alive in their body for years now. You can still detect them. Um, Whereas other patients, the cells go in and and they just disappear within a short amount of time. Um, But so the idea behind that just one infusion, the first the first dose is that, at least in some patients, it seems like the cells can persist for a long time. And that varies between how likely that is to happen is a patient-by-patient thing. It seems to be different in different diseases. It may be different between different CAR T cells and different targets and different designs. I haven't talked a lot about the nuances of you know, how, how the actual receptors are designed, but there are differences between the different ones and development of different sites, and that may impact how likely they are to, to hang around for a long time. Um, now, as we get more comfortable with the safety, and we see in some patients that the t- cells stick around for a short time and then disappear, um, we're starting for the uh, first time to try um, uh, giving additional doses of the cells. Um, so at least at Penn, uh, and, the, and for the myeloma study, the dose we've chosen to give the patients is actually a lot less than is manufactured. Um, so we have, for most of our patients, some doses kind of stored on the shelf that we could potentially give the patients as second infusions if we think the first infusion worked but that the cells just didn't live long enough. Um, and that's being tried um, in a few different studies here 
um, at Penn in sort of a case-by-case basis. And we're hoping to learn about whether that works and whether that might be kind of a standard thing that should be incorporated into um, T-cell therapies or CAR T-cell therapies. And before you mentioned that you were um, using this with stem cell transplant, and I know it's for relapsed refractory patients, how long do you think it will be until you could use it in patients just with a low tumor burden, if that's the overall goal, is to get it early when there's not so much, you know, bulk of tumor? So that's a really good question, and that's a and that's really specific for the CD19 targeting in myeloma, um, because we're not we don't think the target is on most of the cells, um, but only on a small subset. We really think that we'll need some other therapy. Uh, to combine it with if we if it's going to be effective. That may not be the case with targets such as BCMA or CS1, um, and we'll have to just see as we see the results of those studies. Um, uh, in terms of, um, I mean, ultimately, you know, transplant's a toxic therapy, of course, and while it's a really important therapy uh, for patients with myeloma who are, who are well enough to tolerate it and it is really uh, you know, we think improves survival. It's a toxic therapy. And I think everybody is eager for the day where we don't need to do as many transplants as we do now. Um, and I, I, so we will, we are thinking, one of the things we're thinking of, at least for the CD19 concept is, you know, perhaps some, how can we, you know, perhaps use other therapies that are effective other than transplant to kind of get rid of most of the myeloma cells before we, um, before we give anti-CD19 CAR T cells. But we're sort of in the early stages of that. Like I said, we've only just today uh, finished giving um, the cells to the last patient on the current study. Well, you certainly have your work cut out for you. We're so excited about what you're working on. It's so exciting to hear about, you know, deletion 17 patients having great outcomes like that. It's just thrilling. And so that, have, that is one, yeah. one, I'll just say that one op, one thing that people I think are optimistic about with CAR T cells is because they're targeting molecules on the surface of the cell and not some of the molecular machinery inside the cell, even some of these high-risk patients um, may be responsive to therapies that target surface proteins. Um, and that that seems to be the case with daratumumab, that high-risk patients do well um, uh, with the therapy. And we hope that that's the case with CAR T cells, that some of these sort of adverse risk features are not as uh, they, they don't they don't predict a poor response to this type of therapy the way they do to some of the other therapies that we have for myeloma and other diseases. Okay, well, a follow-up question about that. So I was talking to um, one of my doctors, and he said that he was working on CAR T cell work that just didn't target the surface of the protein, but that targeted the interior of the cell. What's the difference? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So CAR T cells, if we think just you know, narrowly about a CAR T cell, those will, CAR T cells recognize uh, molecules on the surface of the cell. However, there's another very uh, technology that's kind of analogous in that it's it's still genetically engineering the T cells to recognize a different target, but it's it's called an engineered T cell receptor or an affinity enhanced T cell receptor. Um, and, and that's another strategy that can be used, and, and that strategy has the capability to target abnormal proteins that are inside the myeloma cells, not just ones on the surface. Um, and that's a very promising technology. In fact, uh, we at Penn uh, just recently completed a study using that um, technology um, uh, to target a protein called NYESO1. That was a study that was done in collaboration with a company called Adaptimmune, um, uh, also working with Dr. Carl June's group here and in collaboration with uh, Dr. Aaron Rappaport at the University of Maryland. We actually, that study was just um, published online yesterday, I think, and that's been presented by Dr. Rappaport at a number of meetings. So that's a very promising uh, approach as well. Um, it does not seem, at least in the early studies, to you know, generated as uh, impressive responses as some of the CAR T cell studies have, but I think we're seeing just like the very first generation of this technology, both on the CAR T cell and the engineered T cell receptor side, and I think in the future we'll see studies using both approaches um, uh, 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 lead to promising results. Okay, interesting. And now this is a genetically, I mean, this is a manufacturing process to make these CAR T cells, correct? It is. So it's a, at least in its current form, this is a, a custom patient-specific product. So um, the T-cells are um, 
harvested from the patient in a process that's very similar to stem cell collection for transplant. Um, and then the cells are taken to the lab um, and they're grown. Um, and this was one of the big advances um, that made this possible is work, you know, by Dr. Carl June and Dr. Bruce Levine here at Penn many years ago, just figuring out how to grow T cells outside the body um, with the, uh, to the numbers that you would need to give a real dose of these cells um, to patients. Um, so the cells are taken out of the patients, grown in uh, the laboratory, while at the same time they're genetically engineered to express the chimeric antigen receptor, the CAR, on their surface. And then once they've um, cultured long enough to grow a sufficient number, then they're reinfused into the patient. So that whole process, when you factor in some of the the, the quality checking processes that have to happen takes, you know, two to four weeks to manufacture the cells um, with, the, with the current technology. Though I think there'll be some advances in that over time, and perhaps that, that lead time will be, uh, will be reduced over time. And who is working on manufacturing? Are there best-of-class methods uh, that you can, that have, are, people are kind of duking it out in the commercial space to create these? Well, so there's a few different, um, there's a couple different culture techniques that are out there um, for growing the lymphocytes, and there's a lot of this, a lot of the, the nitty-gritty technical aspects, actually, I'm not an expert in at all, um, but I would say there's, um, a, a lot of the groups are using these um, this culture technique that uses these things called um, microbeads where attached to the microbeads are a couple antibodies that stimulate the growth of the T cells. So the cells are actually cultured with these beads and these beads provide the stimulatory signals to get the T cells to grow. Um, there are some other techniques that are, that are out there that don't use beads, um, that use other you know, sort of cytokines to stimulate the T cells to grow. Um, I am not enough of an expert in this area at all to be able to predict which one's going to be better over time, but I think, you know, as with selection of targets, as with the genetic engineering me mechanisms, this is another area where I think there's a lot of innovation um, to be done over the years in terms of, you know, uh, making the manufacturing process uh, more sophisticated so that the cells that are delivered are more potent and more likely to be effective. Okay, fantastic. Well, I I know um, we have some caller questions, so I'd like to go ahead and do that. And your descriptions are so clear, it's just fantastic. Oh, so thank you. So we, we so appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, if you have a question for Dr. Garfall, please call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. And we will start with um, caller at 264-7609. So go ahead with your question. Hi, Jenny. That's me, Jack Aiello. Hey, Jack. And uh, by the way, you've asked great questions. I had a couple of quick ones. Just to make sure, I'm wondering, was the level of CD19 expression involved in any of the eligibility criteria for this initial pilot study? That's the first question. And do you envision CAR-T therapy for myeloma ever being used at induction or even earlier at smoldering levels when the myeloma levels are low? So those are both really good questions. So um, so to, the first question is no. We did not screen patients for CD19 expression on their myeloma as a criteria to enter this study. And the reason was because we some of the data that provided the rationale for this study would suggest that even if there's no CD19 on the myeloma plasma cells at all, that there might be some myeloma cells kind of masquerading as B cells, uh, and B cells all express CD19, um, and that that might be enough alone to make this therapy effective. So we didn't want to we didn't want to cut off that possibility um, by excluding patients who had CD19 no CD19 expression on their myeloma cells. In fact, our first patient who's had this very nice response, when we looked at this the CD19 expression on her myeloma cells, with very sensitive techniques like RT PCR, 99.95 percent of her myeloma cells had no detectable CD19, and there was presence of CD19 on just 0.05 percent of her plasma cells um, of her myeloma plasma cells. Uh, so that was that was that is a patient that you would call a CD19 negative myeloma by any standard criteria. Um, but you know this tiny subset with CD, with with uh, with CD19 may have been enough to allow her to benefit from this therapy. Um, so no, we didn't screen patients for that, and we have actually found and that that most patients have.
small subsets of plasma cells that are CD19 positive, um, even though most of their plasma cells may be CD19 negative. Um, to answer your second question, uh, if you could remind me just in a quick one line what it was, I'm sorry, I've forgotten it. That's okay. CAR-T therapy ever being used at induction or at smoldering? Yes. So I, I think it all depends on how things develop in the coming years in terms of its safety um, and uh, and its efficacy. I mean, certainly the, a barrier right now to taking somebody who, you know, is newly diagnosed with myeloma and is sick with the myeloma for whatever reason, the, um, you know, bone lesions, kidney failure, you know, these therapies take – um, some period of time to manufacture, and we have really fantastic drugs that are safe, fortunately. So I don't see the initial, initial therapy of myeloma uh, being something where CAR T cells are used, but I think potentially um, as a consolidation strategy, perhaps you know with transplant or in place of the way we use autologous transplant right now is a possibility. Um, uh, and, and, and the smoldering question is interesting. I mean, wouldn't it be great to prevent myeloma? I mean, myeloma is an awful disease, and even, uh, and, and even the patients who do best with it usually are sick with it when they first get it and potentially with some irreparable organ damage. So it would be great to be able to take patients who we know have a high risk of developing myeloma, and if there were a safe therapy um, that were effective, uh, sure, I don't see why not, but I think we're a long way from that point for sure. Thanks so much for your very clear answers. No problem. Thank you for your questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jack, for your question. And thank you for your answer, Dr. Garfel. Okay, our next question caller is at 949-5572. Go ahead with your question. Okay, caller at 949-5572. Go ahead with your question. Oh, hi, Dr. Garfel. This is Paul. Uh, thank you for taking your time on the show with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for listening. Um, so maybe the answer to this, but I didn't hear it. A follow-up question to the last one. Does this trial also include a transplant? Which trial? I'm sorry. I think the BCMA trial. Yeah, so I it, it will not include a transplant. So and that's just simply... Okay. The, and that, and and that's that's largely because the reason we're including a transplant in the in the trial targeting CD19 is because we think for if for CD19 directed therapy to work we need some other therapy to get rid or at least reduce substantially the number of malignant plasma cells that don't express the target the CD19 in order to see any benefit from targeting CD19 um and and the, and of course the jury's still out over whether that's a that that strategy is going to work in the long term. We have some early evidence that's promising in this small trial, but you know the ultimate test will be in larger, more definitive studies. Um, but for 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 um, for for targets where we expect it to be on most or all of the plasma cells, um, there's not a need that same need for transplant. There is some need, we think, for some what we call lymphodepleting chemotherapy, which is a little bit of a preconditioning to kind of suppress the immune system a little bit to let the CAR T cells grow inside the body. Um, and almost all CAR T cell trials do incorporate kind of a medium dose, not a high dose like high dose melphalan that you give with the transplant, but some kind of medium dose of chemotherapy um, to, um, to uh, uh, allow... Uh, the patient's immune system to receive the cells and allow the cells to grow. And there's various reasons why you have to do that, but it seems to be a theme that that little bit of chemotherapy beforehand is important for allowing the CAR T cells to um, to uh, thrive uh, after they're infused. All right, and, and then follow-up question to that. When does the trial open and how many patients will be involved in this trial? So I can't provide too many details about that just because we're very restricted about how we recruit patients to clinical trials, and this sort of forum isn't a suitable place to recruit patients to clinical trials, but all clinical trials, uh, once they're open, are listed on clinicaltrials.gov, um, and patients can go to the Abramson Cancer Center website uh, uh, where we have on our website um, all active clinical trials for all the diseases we treat. Um, so we exp and we don't have a firm date for opening the trial yet. As, as, as you may know, these things tend to move around a little bit, so we hope to have the trial open in the next couple months. Um, again, that trial will be, will be led by my colleague, Dr. Adam Cohen, um, and we hope to um, we'll be able to post something on clinicaltrials.gov and the Abramson Cancer Center website as soon as it's open. Well, you just opened up another host of questions. Like <laughs> clinicaltrials.gov is not a place to go to 
to apply for a clinical trial. That's not how it how it works. So that's no, no, that's but not you really can help, no, you'll be able really to helpful. you'll you'll be able to find on clinicaltrials.gov the contact information um, to inquire about uh, uh, availability of slots, things like that. Okay. So you're, there's, but there's no there's no sense of timing right now. Uh, I don't have any. I, I don't have detailed timing information that I can that I can disclose in this forum. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you. It well, should we'll, be in the next couple of months. It should be in the next couple of months. All right. Perfect. Thank you. And we'll be watching for it. Okay. So my final question for you is: How can patients um, help accelerate this very exciting work that you're doing? So that's a great question, and um, and I, I should take this opportunity to thank you, Jenny, for creating such a fantastic forum for patients to hear um, about clinical research. I mean, uh, with this website and these interviews, you've really, um, uh, I think, been able to have some really um, fantastic uh, investigators come and talk about their research, and I'm really honored to be among them. Um, but I think, you know, it's 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 becoming easier and easier uh, for patients to gain access in some, to, to information about clinical research. In some, in some sense, it's overwhelming. And I think clinicaltrials.gov is a great example of this. It's very hard for a patient to navigate this. But I think patients can, um, what patients can do is ask their physicians about clinical research, even if they're not at a center uh, where clinical research is being conducted nearly all oncologists these days think of clinical research as part of clinical care. Uh, and even centers that aren't actively participating in research collaborate closely with centers that are participating in research um, and, and can point you, you know, given the, the medical details of your particular case, towards a center um, that has clinical research options available to you if you're so inclined to participate. Um, I'm always amazed by uh, and humbled by um, the work our patients do just to live with this disease, let alone participate in clinical trials, which are often difficult on patients in terms of the time commitment. Um, and uh, I'm extremely grateful for all the efforts of our patients on our trial um, and, and, uh, and in the myeloma community in general, which is this incredibly uh, uh, lively community of engaged patients. So I think, you know, uh, there's a number of great patient resources, your website among them, Jenny, um, where patients can learn about cutting-edge research in myeloma. Uh, and, and, but ultimately, you know, the best person to help guide a patient to clinical trials is their physician. Um, and, and even that, uh, where if patients are treated at night sites that actively participate in clinical research, uh, their physicians can guide them um, towards uh, places where clinical research is happening if it's appropriate for them. All right, perfect. Well, <clears throat> From a patient standpoint, we're very excited to help accelerate your work. So I always suggest that patients look at clinical trials and help come up to speed themselves so they can at least ask their doctor intelligent questions about what would be most appropriate for them. Because, you know, if we doubled participation in clinical trials, you could do your work so much faster. No, I agree. I mean, I, I think having, you know, that is um, having... One of the most gratifying things is is, is off being able to offer clinical uh, participation in a clinical trial to a patient who's enthusiastic about it. I mean, it's such a um, it's a satisfying thing to be part of to to, um, to especially you know nowadays where the therapies that are even in phase one trials are often very very promising. Um, it's 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 gratifying to sort of see science advance before your eyes, often to the benefit of the patients involved in the research. So um, I, I agree. I think it's the enthusiasm. We, as clinical investigators, we thrive on the enthusiasm of our patients um, for advances in the disease, um, uh, in the treatment of the disease, and um, and I think you know continued enthusiasm from myeloma patients is a huge huge driver of progress in this in this field. Well, we are thrilled, and we're so grateful that you took the time today to describe it for us. Um, you did just a great job explaining it, and um, we're excited to see where it leads. So thank you so much. No, and I'd like to thank you also for the opportunity, and I want to once again thank all my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania who are part of a very, very large program driving these therapies uh, for it. I'm just very one small part, uh, one very small piece of it, um, and uh, we're all very fortunate to work in, the, in this field and to um, interact with our patients who receive these therapies, and we're very, very optimistic about um, the potential of CAR T-cells and other uh, exciting innovations in multiple myeloma research to improve the care uh, of uh, patients with this uh, very difficult disease. Well, thank you again, and we just so appreciate you being on the show. My pleasure, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to My Loma Crowd Radio. Patient, we believe that patients can help support the discovery of a cure, and we encourage you to become involved. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.